Amen. Let's bow our heads together. Father, as we come before you this morning, we're so grateful that you know us, Lord, that you provided this time and place for us to gather together. As brothers and sisters in you, Lord, to worship you, to praise you, and to dive into your word. We love you and ask that you would bless all things uh, here today, Lord. We lift it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us in standing and we'll worship our Lord together. Last week we did the candle of hope. I'm going to relight that. This week is called the prophet's candle. And it's talking about preparation. So that's the focus. The two verses, well, three verses I have. But first in um, John 1, 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. What that means is the light did not, or the dark did not overpower it. Light always, always overpowers darkness. Key, key thought there. And then in Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has broken it. The second candle reminds us that the prophets waited for a Messiah to come and save the people. God wanted his people to be ready for the coming Messiah. So he sent prophets throughout history to remind them <coughs> and us to prepare our heart. He sent John the Baptist to prepare the people for Jesus' coming. And this tells us that God wants us to recognize him and to know him. Not just know about him, but to have a relationship with him. To progressively know him more and more. In John 14, 21, one of my favorite verses. It says, Jesus says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and will disclose myself to him, or reveal myself to him. So it's a great promise that when we walk, when we walk in obedience to God's commands, his word, he'll reveal himself to us more and more. And that's kind of my admonition for us today. Let us focus this Christmas season on knowing Jesus more seeking him through his word let us prepare a heart for new deeper powerful work of the holy spirit in us ask god pray for this he loves to give good gifts to his children let's pray lord reveal yourself more fully to us in all your amazing overwhelming glory prepare our heart for the continuing work you have called us to do in this coming new year Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Lemon Grove. Glad you're here today. Uh, God's choicest blessings on your day. Nice time of year when we start changing things up a little bit and just remembering when our Savior did come and save us. Uh, it's, it's a great time of year. Michael, why don't you come on up? Michael's going to read Psalm 13. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? 
having sorrow in my heart daily. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So you can notice a pattern in some of David's psalms, or a lot of David's psalms actually, where he starts off, it's kind of a negative note almost at first, but then by the end of the psalm, he works his way back around to the place where he's trusting in God's mercy and his salvation. So, you know, he kind of gets his little little rumble out of the way and then and then he gets back to where he should be. Um, but a beautiful song, thank you, Michael. And now the worship team is going to play one more song. And while they do, if you would like to support what God is doing through your tithes and offerings, there's in the coffee box in the hallway. God bless you. This, this chapter is its one of a kind. Uh, it contains the longest prayer in the Bible, and it's all, all Jesus. It's all him. 
and we get to kind of eavesdrop on a conversation between him and his father. And so uh, anytime you get to listen to a conversation between God the Father and God the Son, uh, it's time well spent, and you will learn something, I am sure of that. So, I don't know, for, for some reason I just kind of get the feeling that, um, yes, this was a prayer from Jesus to his Father, but I think it was meant for the others who were hearing it as well. I mean, it wasn't just, uh, it, it had a purpose, you know, he had more than one purpose for, for, for making this beautiful prayer. And it is such a beautiful chapter that it's kind of like when, when Moses went up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. It's kind of one of those chapters where we almost feel like we should take our shoes off when we come to it because it truly brings us into the Holy of Holies. And uh, we're going to get really priceless insight into the personal, private, intimate relationship between the Father and the Son. And now as Jesus began his earthly ministry, when he was at the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee, they ran out of wine. You remember that. His mother suggested that he do something about it. And he declared, woman, gune, term of respect, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. That's from John chapter 2. And in John chapter 7, when they sought to arrest him, no man could put their hand upon him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. That's in John chapter 7. And in the next chapter, as Jesus taught in the temple, no one laid hands on him. For his hour had not yet come. And now in this final discourse with his disciples, he declares over and over that the hour has now come. What hour is he speaking of? It's the hour when the dead would hear his voice and live. The hour when he would depart from this world and go to the Father. The hour of his death when he would dismiss his spirit. Such an important chapter. John Knox, the great Scottish reformer, called John chapter 17 the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Scripture. He loved this chapter so much that as he lay on his deathbed, he had his wife read it to him over and over again. An excellent choice. In this chapter, we see Jesus approaching his own death. He was about to go to the cross, and he knew it. Here he pauses to talk things over with his father, giving him an after-action report. If you've been in the military, you know what an after-action report is. Concerning what he did in the three years of his public ministry here on earth, we're going to see him identify several areas as the foundations of his success. So you see the world sees money, power, prestige is foundational, but Jesus shows us an entirely different way of evaluating life and ministry. John chapter 17, verse 1 says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. So begins which what is, as we already mentioned, the longest prayer in the Bible. Jesus had talked to his disciples about the Father in the upper room, and now he talks to his Father about the disciples. We can learn a lot from this prayer. The first thing that Jesus models for us here is the true purpose of prayer. We talked about it before. Prayer is not a way of getting God to do our will in heaven. Prayer is the way to get people to do God's will on earth. Once you understand this, you're going to find yourself praying in an entirely new manner. That's what Jesus is doing here. He prays, Father, glorify me so that you might be glorified. Even if that means that I'm going to be pinned to the cross of Calvary, you might say, well, that sounds sadistic. But it isn't, because Jesus sees the crown on the other side of the cross. A crown of unspeakable joy, full of great glory. We only see a few months or years down the road, but God sees the next 10 billion years. You see, Jesus allowing the Father 
to be glorified through him, ultimately brought a, bought a bride for him for all eternity. And there's a radical transformation that takes place when a believer finally gets the big picture and stops saying, God, do it my way. God is not Burger King. We don't get to give orders about how things should be done. He doesn't say, hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. God is not Burger King. He is the King of Kings. With absolute clarity and a flawless track record, he sees what's going to be best in the long run. Verse 2, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Now stop and think about that for a minute. Jesus has authority over all flesh. He could make this universe and every individual in it bow down to him. He could bring us all into subjection to him and make robots out of all of us. That's the last thing he would want to do. But he does have authority over all flesh. Now, the, the church is the Father's love gift to his Son. And Jesus gives eternal life to as many as the Father has given him. That brings up the question of free will. And it is not my intent to get into that discussion extensively today. I'll just say that there are extreme Calvinists and extreme Arminianists. The truth lies somewhere between the two extremes. If God would somehow reveal the elect ones to me, I'd give the gospel only to them. But God doesn't do this. He says that whoever will may come. He makes this legitimate offer to every person. It's remarkable. If you won't come to him, then you have no excuse at all. Your condemnation will be that you turn down the offer that God has made to you. Verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is to know God and to know Jesus Christ. Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. Messiah, the King of Israel. To know, which is from the Greek word gnosko, to know him means to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. And when we move on in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to the place of assurance. Anyone without the assurance of salvation is either unsaved or is just a babe in Christ. Life eternal is to know the only genuine God and to know Jesus Christ. That is why the study of God's word is so important. Many people stay in the fringes and they're never sure that they're saved. Verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Now, that's an important verse. I want you to notice that Jesus didn't say, I started the work, or I was going to get to the work. I've been trying to get the lights up on the house for Christmas. And I, keep, I keep starting and I keep not, not getting there. But Jesus said, I have finished the work. The roads from Bible studies and Bible conferences are littered with the broken commitments of men and women who began but never finished what God told them to do. Aren't you glad that after Noah finished the frame on the ark, he didn't say, close enough, we don't need a roof. We'd have all been sunk. No, he finished the work completed the task. How about you? If you knew that you only had a few hours to live, would you be able to say, Father, I have finished the work that you gave me to do? Or would you have to say, I know you put this on my heart last year and I, I really meant to get to it, but have you finished the work? Saul did it, King Saul. The prophet Samuel, relaying a message from the Lord, told Saul, now I want you to go and attack Amalek, and I want you to utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 15. God told Saul 
do not let one Amalekite remain. And Saul killed almost every one. But Saul and the people decided to keep Agag, the king of the Amalekites, as a trophy, along with the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. So what, you ask? What's the big deal with that? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you what the big deal is. 25 years later, Saul was severely wounded in battle. He was on Mount Gilboa. A young man encountered him there. Saul called him over and he asked the young man, Who are you? The man told Saul, I am an Amalekite. 2 Samuel chapter 1. Now Saul did not want to be captured alive and abused by the enemy. So he told the young man, kill me. And the young man did exactly that. Where did this young man come from? Well, somewhere along the way, Agag fathered a son. And through Samuel, God had told Saul, do not leave a single Amalekite alive. Saul could say, I gave it a pretty good shot. 99.99% isn't too bad. But the thing he didn't finish was the thing that did him in. But wait, there's more. In the book of Esther, we read that a, a guy named Haman devised a plot to exterminate the Jews. And this is fascinating. The date was set. They were going to utterly wipe out the Jews with the king's consent. They had issued a royal decree which could not be altered. But here's the fascinating part. Esther chapter 3 tells us that Haman was an Agagite. Does that ring a bell? Haman was a descendant of Agag. So about 600 years after the Lord had told Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites, Haman, who was Agag's descendant, sought to utterly destroy the Jews. Now some might wonder why God gave Saul such a seemingly horrible command to utterly destroy the Amalekites. In looking at the picture in Samuel, it might seem like God's demand was cruel. But remember, unlike us, God can look down the road and see what lies in the future. The Lord realized that if the Amalekites were not completely destroyed, one day a descendant would arise and seek to destroy all of God's people. If Saul had been completely obedient to God, Haman would never have existed. His attempt to destroy God's people would never have been. God can see that far in advance. Father really does know best, so trust him. Now, Amalek is a type of our flesh, living after the flesh. God had ordered that our flesh be put to death. The book of Romans tells us, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What has God called you to do? What has he spoken to your heart about? Maybe there's a certain sin that's got to go, and you think, well, I've got it pretty much taken care of. I know the Lord has told me not to do this, but I really have cut way back. Have you finished it? No, but I've got it under control. Watch out. Agag is out to get you. From the cross, Jesus cried, Te telestai. It is finished. I'm so glad he didn't say, close enough. I almost finished it. I'm going to come down now. Because if he had come down from the cross, we would go down to hell. But he paid the full price. He did finish the work. Verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify me together with or alongside yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Philippians chapter 2 speaks of Jesus emptying himself. Some have tried to teach that he emptied himself of his deity, but John makes it very clear that the word became flesh. The little baby in Mary's lap was God. He could have spoken this universe out of existence. He wasn't just 99.99% God. He was and is 100% God. So of what did he empty himself? His prerogatives of deity. He laid aside his glory. 
it's Christmas time, we tend to make a big deal out of the, the shepherds, angels, and the wise men who came to see him. But that scene did not play out the way that it should have. He is the Lord of glory. All of creation should have been there. Every human being on the face of the earth should have been there. When President Kennedy was assassinated, people from all over the country and around the world came for his funeral. The whole world should have attended the Lord of Glory's birth when he condescended to come to the earth to save the likes of us. He had the right to lay claim to such glory, but he laid it aside. Verse 5 tells us that as the day of his crucifixion approached, Jesus was ready to, turn, to return to heaven, to the glory that was rightfully his. Verse 6 says, I have manifested or revealed your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So Jesus thought back on the three years of ministry and teaching with his chosen disciples, and he summarized it this way. Jesus just didn't just teach about God's name, his character. He manifested it. He displayed that character. Today, followers of Jesus Christ have a similar call. They have a duty. Paul wrote that believers are like living letters read by the world in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We have the responsibility to manifest God's name and nature to a watching and desperately needy world. Verse 6 gives us a sense that the disciples first belonged to God the Father and were then given to God the Son. You could say that Jesus generously judged his disciples, but he saw a genuine work of God in them. For all their faults and all their failures, they truly had kept God's word. Verse 7, Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. So in the first part of his prayer, Jesus prayed concerning the small company of believers, the disciples that were with him. His prayer centered around them. You've given them to me, I've manifested your name to them. They're yours, but you have given them to me. And I've given your word to them. Things are now complete because they believe that you've sent me. Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, this might startle you. But it's no more startling than the statement that Jesus made. Jesus does not pray for the world today. His ministry of intercession is for his own who are in the world. He doesn't pray for the world. He died for the world. What more could he do for the world? He has sent the Holy Spirit into the world to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Jesus Christ isn't praying for the world system to be transformed. He's praying for those that the Father has called out of the world system. Verse 11, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. So here Jesus prays for two wonderful things. First, he prays for us to be kept will be kept because we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and because our Savior is praying for us. His other request is for us to be one. He prays for unity among believers. He's not praying for an ecumenical movement or that we would all belong to the same denomination. Sadly, believers down here are pretty well divided. However, there's only one true church and every believer in Jesus Christ is a member of that church. It's called the body of Christ. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition or destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus said, I have kept them. According to his teaching in John chapter 10, 
We're in the Father's hand, and no one can pluck us from his grasp. Nothing can loosen us from his grip. While we must not be ignorant of Satan's devices, the key to overcoming darkness is to walk in the light and realize that Jesus Christ himself promised to keep us. Jesus said, I have kept them. Well, what about us? In order to apply this to our lives, we need to realize that we can't keep our children, our grandchildren, or people with whom we're linked in ministry, because they're not ours to keep, they're his. One day at a time, you have opportunities to be a blessing to your children and to the others to whom you minister, to serve them, to disciple them, to love them. But you can't cling to them because they're not yours. The Lord God says, behold, all souls are mine, in Ezekiel chapter 18. I can't keep people who don't belong to me. But I must tenderly keep them in my heart. This is what Paul speaks of in his epistles when he says, I have you in my heart. Old Testament priests wore stones, representing each tribe over their hearts on a breastplate and on their shoulders because there's a connection between the burden of intercession and the heart of compassion. When you pray for people, you're gonna find that as you bear them on your shoulders in intercessory ministry, they'll become jewels on your heart. But what about this son of perdition? Jesus said, did I not choose you, the 12, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. That's from John chapter 6. Judas was never saved. That's why he wasn't kept. Verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So Jesus prayed not only that his disciples would be kept and in unity, he prayed for joy fulfilled in their lives. Jesus lived a life filled with joy. His joy was rooted in unbroken fellowship with his Father. It was the fruit of true faith and confidence in his Father, in seeing the great things that God had done. His joy was never diminished by his own sin, by deception, or by allowing even the smallest foothold to the devil. His purpose is to multiply joy in our lives, not to subtract it, despite what the world might try to tell us, Verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, in, in case you hadn't noticed, God's word causes problems in the world today. The Bible is a revolutionary book. In fact, it is the most revolutionary book in the entire world. It's revolutionary to teach that you can't save yourself, that only Christ can save you. And you can't make this world better. Only Jesus Christ can do that. That's revolutionary. Now, believe me, the world doesn't want to hear that. They'd rather plant a few flowers and try to save the whales or clean up pollution. The problem is that the real pollution is in the human heart. And we can't clean that up ourselves. Verse 15 begins, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. And boy, there are times when I truly wish that he would. When you take a good look around, it, it's so sad. When I see our nation's decline, the inflation, the rising taxes, I see the schools and the government attempt to remove any thought of Jesus Christ from our public discourse. And I look at utterly ridiculous court rulings, just so many stupid iniquities. It makes me want to move to a remote island in the South Pacific maybe even establish my own sovereign nation there. <laughs> it would be so nice if we could start over again, just like the pilgrims did when they came to the new world. But Jesus said, Father, I don't pray that you take them out of the world. That's kind of a bummer. It means we've got to stick around here a little while longer. Verse 15 concludes, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Jesus didn't pray for us to be taken out of the battle. He prayed that we would be strengthened and protected in it. Verse 16, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them 
set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. The degree to which we as believers realize that we're not of this world, that will determine how completely we fulfill his will and accomplish his purpose. As you know, sanctify means to set apart for God's special pleasure and use. It implies holiness, being set apart from the world's corruption and for God's use. We don't do this for ourselves. We can't try as we might. It's a work of God in and through our lives. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So not only did Jesus keep those entrusted to him, he also sent them out. He made opportunities for them. And earlier, Jesus had said, they are not of the world. And yet, he sent them into the world. Brothers and sisters, listen carefully. We are not to be of the world, but we must be in the world. And in other words, we must not seek to isolate ourselves from the world. Do you remember when Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan? Well, you can't walk down the other side of the street to avoid the world's stench and infection. Just as God became man, yet retained his deity, we live among humanity, but we're linked to eternity. We're here in the flesh, but we're really living in the heavenlies. That's where our hope, our destiny, and our source of strength lie. In the aftermath of the December 7th attacks at Pearl Harbor, some 81 years ago, divers were sent out to rescue survivors of the attack, many of whom were trapped in capsized ships. In one compartment of the USS Utah, the divers found it impossible to get to the men trapped inside. The divers could hear men tapping, is there any hope in Morse code? But rescue was impossible with the technology that was available at that time. In a sense, we're like deep sea divers. We're down here on earth, but we're connected to heaven. We don't fit in here. We don't belong here. And we aren't going to stay here, but the Lord has allowed us to be here. He's pumping the oxygen of the Holy Spirit and the scriptures to us, saying, there are people to rescue. Do what you can as I lead you and guide you. We've got souls to save, people to reach, things to do, so we need to get moving until we go home to heaven. Verse 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now that is some good news right there. Jesus expanded his prayer beyond the realm of the disciples who were with him at the moment, right on down to you and to me. Verse 21, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. In verse 11, Jesus specifically prayed that the disciples, the 11 disciples present for his prayer, would remain unified. Here in verse 21, Jesus broadened the sense of that prayer to all believers, that they may all be one. Unity among the broader body of Christ was and is very important to Jesus. A divided, fractured church presents a very poor witness to the world, you see. George Whitefield was such a powerful evangelist that it wasn't unusual for 30,000 people to attend one of his open-air meetings. He was very anointed. He was eloquent. History records how many orators and actors would come just to watch him. Whitefield had a contemporary named Charles Wesley. Wesley was also preaching to multitudes of people. Whitefield's and Wesley's views on some issues were so diverse that they would take out ads in newspapers to explain what they believed as they did and why the other was amiss. Some people thought that Whitefield and Wesley hated each other, but then a reporter asked Whitefield if he expected to see Wesley in heaven, and Whitefield answered, no, he's going to be so close to the throne and I'm going to be so far back that I'll never see him. Now, I like that. 
these guys had very different doctrinal views and very different flavors in ministry. But they had unity through love and in their, even in their diversity. Verse 22. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now only the Spirit of God can accomplish that. The unity that exists between the Father and the Son is the unity that is to exist between the believer and the Lord Jesus Christ. And have loved them as you have loved me means that, and this is going to blow you away, God loves you as much as he loves the Lord Jesus Christ. That boggles the mind. It's just too wonderful for us to understand. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now I truly long to behold Jesus in his glory. How I long to see him sitting upon his throne, to see him in his glorified state. How I long to be part of the company in the book of Revelation that sings, Worthy is the Lamb because he was slain. And he's redeemed us by his blood out of all the nations, tribes, tongues, and people. And has made us kings and priests to our God. And we will reign with him upon the earth. Worthy indeed is the Lamb to receive glory and honor and dominion and might and power and authority. I long for the day when I will see him in that glory. What, what could be better than that? If anyone's prayers are effective, it would be the prayers of Jesus Christ. When he's praying for you, well, you, you just can't lose. We can be certain that his prayers are powerful and effective, that the Father is going to answer his prayers. We have all the assurance in the world that we're going to be there to see him in his glory. He asked the Father that that might be so. Surely the Father won't deny his request. And if that doesn't excite you, nothing will. Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. The last thing that our Lord mentions shortly before he would be arrested is his desire, his prayer, that his love might be in our hearts and in our lives. We talk a lot about grace and faith, and rightly so, but the great desire of his heart is that his love should be manifest in the lives of those that he has redeemed. That should put us on our faces before him. As we treat people as though they're already glorified, as we speak the truth in love that we might be unified, as we keep those that the Lord has given to us on our hearts through intercession, as we manifest and declare the Father's nature, as we give people the precise word and share the scriptures with them, as we finish the work that he gives us to do, we'll be doing the very things that Jesus said our lives should be all about. How much of his love is manifest in you? If you're a student of management, you know that this measurement of success is radically contrary to that which is propagated in our modern American culture. It doesn't chart well in opinion polls, on financial fact sheets, or in resumes. It won't put a trophy in your trophy case. It won't put a plaque on your wall. But it will put a voice in your ear, and that voice will be saying, well done, good and faithful servant. And after that, isn't, isn't that what every child of God longs to hear? Well, next week, we'll continue our journey through the Gospel of John with a study in John chapter 18. Let's pray. Father, we are humbled and awed at the depth of your provision. 
at the overwhelming nature of your faithfulness, your goodness, your compassion, your tenderness, your care. And Lord, you set a standard that on our own we cannot live up to. Can't add one thing to what you've accomplished. All we can do, Lord, is thank you and go along for the ride and make ourselves available to you. And say to you, Father, we give you free reign over our hearts and our minds and our lives. Take our hearts and form them. Take our minds and transform them. Take our wills and conform them to yours. We love you and we thank you for this day. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus, amen. 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 And now Pastor Tom is going to come forward and lead us in. Do you, guys have, do you guys realize how good that sermon was? Yep. Yeah. I hope you do. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. God is good. Um, I've been uh, doing a, a word study on Shekinah last few weeks. And it's all over the Bible. It's all over the place. Sometimes in unexpected ways, sometimes in obvious ways. We know that uh, the major prophets saw the Shekinah glory in different visions, right? Ezekiel did. He saw the throne of God with all the wheels spinning and the cherubim. And Daniel saw a vision of Christ. And Isaiah, when he saw um, the vision of God, he said, well, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And he felt very unworthy to be in God's presence. Um, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration with his three disciples, um, that was the kind of glory. And I think those those disciples fell asleep at that time after after um, Peter said, let's build tabernacles for us. Um, he fell asleep. I think it was the over, overwhelming power of his presence, of God's presence. So um, I've just been thinking about that for um, a communion service. And... Um, Do we understand the fullness of God? Do you remember a book in the 60s or 70s called Your God is Too Small? Do you remember that? I read it so long ago I forget what was in it, but the idea is that we don't think highly enough of God. That we see things in, we read things in the scripture and they kind of go over our head and we think, wow, that's pretty, pretty awesome, but we don't take the time to think about it enough to realize how great God is, that he's better in all the ways that are described in the Bible. He's better than we can imagine. He's off the charts good, off the charts compassionate and loving and powerful. And um, anyway, we need to know him more. That's my, what my point is for today, is we need to know him more. So we're in this season of Christmas, and we're celebrating his birth, and that's great. And we have a lot of extra special things that we do, get-togethers and extra food and gifts and families together. And some people kind of experience the opposite side of that because they are lonely or they don't, their, their life isn't what they want it to be. So they, exp they experience a lot of depression and, and um, downheartedness. So I'm just encouraging us and myself, I'm, I'm right in there with you, to seek God's glory. Seek it, ask him. I think he loves to give us gifts. Ask God to show you more of his glory in some way. Through a person, through an event, through a presentation, a concert, through the word of God, through prayer. However he wants to do it. Just ask him to show you, reveal himself more to you. So that your picture of God can be like cinemascopic. You know, big, gigantic overpowering so that the result of that is that we follow him more eagerly we follow him more closely we follow him more perfectly so that we can have a better impact bigger impact on the world the people around us is that a deal we try that okay just spend this time of christmas doing all the things you do for christmas that's good that's fine 
but also add to your prayers, maybe on a daily basis, God, show me your glory. God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. your body. We thank you again as we remember your sacrifice, that you obeyed the Father, completed the work as Pastor said, and you sacrificed yourself. You allowed yourself to be arrested. You allowed yourself to be beaten. You could have stopped it at any moment, but you knew that that's why you came. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you did complete that work, to you allowed yourself to be killed in our place. You may take and eat. And this juice, Lord, represents your blood. Sinless, perfect, covering our sins. Changing our heart. It was an, it was an internal change, Lord, that came about because of your blood. It's an amazing thing. It's uh, beyond our comprehension, but it's your plan. And you spoke to our hearts and you drew us to you, and we surrendered our lives to you. We confessed you as, as Lord and Savior. We thank you, Lord, that you shed your blood for us. We take and drink.
all about is grace. And may that grace go with you now as you leave this place. May it transform your hearts and your minds. May it just conform you to the image of his firstborn son, the one who came to die. He was born to die. And he did that for you and for me. The Bible says that he endured the cross, despising the shame, for the joy set before him. We talked about this before. What was the joy set before him? It was you. It was me. It was us. We were the joy set before him. And he knew before the world was ever created, before you ever drew your first breath, he knew that you would be here today. He knew that you would be loving him and serving him and walking with him. He knew it. What an amazing God we serve. And what wretched misery we see in the world around us among the people who don't have the hope that we have. So now, go out there and help them find that hope. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. The Lord lift up. His countenance. His countenance. Upon thee. And give thee peace. Bless you.